Yeah. No, I understand where they are. Yeah. Uh, Is that Stu Jackson's old What's that? I don't know what's the original. I think, yeah. Anyway, she's going to be in front of the trains right on the train. Fabulous. Fabulous. Wonderful. I'm sure she's learned a lot about that. Not me, I'm involved in foreign service. But it's the it's the administrator making the train. Those are patterns that one doesn't learn in school. Okay. I'll keep my fingers crossed. No, I'm not. Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, start us off. My name's uh, Kent Hughes. I direct a project on America and the global economy here. And I'd like to just say a word or two about the Woodrow Wilson Center before introducing our distinguished speaker and our two outstanding panelists. The uh, Wilson Center, as you may know, was established in 1968 as a living memorial to Woodrow Wilson, our 28th president. In the, the Congress, when it decided to create a living memorial rather than a, another statue or another monument, had in mind Wilson's observation about himself. He was, as you know, the only president to have a PhD. And he felt that in his own life, he'd managed to combine the world of ideas and the world of action, and was firmly convinced by bringing those two worlds together, you found yourself with better policy and at the same time, better research. And we have tried to capture that idea in our own mission by bringing the best of the thinkers together with people who really are on the front line making policy. We are pleased today to take a look at something that has been a little overlooked, I think, in the trade dialogue here in Washington, which is the fact that while we are engaged in a flurry of bilateral negotiations around the world, this same approach is now being emulated in other parts of the world in particular in Asia. And we are extremely fortunate to have with us this year as a Wilson Center Fellow, Vinny Agarwal, who is a professor of political economy at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, you may have just glanced at a small sample of Vinny's publications as you came in. Uh, we tend to think of Vinny as being in that group of people like Senator Moynihan, who came here after he retired. We used to talk about Senator Moynihan as having really written more books than most of us have read. <laughs> and uh, it's been a considerable embarrassment to me, who's trying to finish a book, that Vinny has come out with two publications while he's here working on a third. <laughs> he has a, a very distinguished experience with the policy world uh, as well. If you look at the, the small bio there, you'll note that he's consulted with a wide range of groups. He's been an eminent person uh, in the, uh, for the APEC and has, in fact, started an APEC center at Berkeley. Uh, in addition to his many publications, he initiated a publication, Business and Politics. And after Vinny makes his formal remarks, we have two outstanding panelists. Uh, the first to speak on my far left, on your far right, is uh, Gary Huffbauer. Uh, Gary, again, is someone who really fits the Wilson Center mold, is that he has combined in his own life distinguished academic work with a good deal of actually policy experience. Uh, I was joking with him earlier about 
his celebration of the Senate recently repealing the FISC, an export subsidy. Um, I've come to think of Gary as the godfather of the FISC. He designed it when he was in the Carter Treasury Department as an answer to the need to get rid of an earlier, somewhat similar export incentive known as the Domestic International Sales Corporation. Uh, he also uh, headed the uh, the tax group, uh, international tax group in Treasury in an earlier administration. He's had a number of positions in the academic world, and including uh, two distinguished positions at Georgetown University. And he is currently the Reginald Jones Senior Fellow at the Institute for International Economics. To my immediate left, and your nearer right, is Paula Stern. Uh, Paula also has a distinguished academic background with with many publications. She has also been very much involved in making policy in the trade world. She is a former uh, chairwoman of the International Trade Commission and served for a number of years on ACTIPAN, the, uh, the advisory committee on trade policy and negotiations. Let me now uh, turn to Vinny, who has a scintillating presentation <laughs> for us. I've had a sort of a preview myself. And after we have uh, brief comments from our two panelists, we'll open it up for all your questions. Well, thank you, Kent. Uh, I'm not sure about scintillating, but since I now also teach in a business school, I have a PowerPoint presentation, which is de rigueur in all business schools. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be at the Wilson Center, and Kent has been involved with uh, all of my book launches that I've been doing. And this is the last one, I promise, and I'm <laughs> leaving soon. But I've had a great time, and thank you very much. I'd also like to thank Paula and uh, Gary Huffbar for showing up. Uh, I've admired their work for a long time, and I'm sure they'll be nice to me because I've known them for a long time. So <laughs> everything's going to work out well, as I've been hoping. I wouldn't for. make that a No, that was a, I was just kidding about that one. So the title is, is Kent's If You Don't Like It, and If You Like It, It's Mine. Uh, <laughs> Zelix knew Zelix. Kent was the one who suggested we have alliteration, so we worked on this together, and we, we came up with some alliteration. It's not entirely accurate, as we'll see, because I don't think that the current trend in U.S. policy began with Zelix, but I think it began some time ago under President Clinton and even earlier. So uh, having been in Washington, I know if you can't say it in a few bullet points, it's not worth saying. So here are my four points. <laughs> First, I think that the diversity of trade agreements has been poorly specified. People talk about regionalism. People talk about bilateralism. <coughs> people have not really examined, I think, exactly what kind of agreements have been developed. And this is the academic in me trying to specify the dependent variable mm -hmm. of what we're trying to explain more carefully. Second, the popular bicycle theory of trade, which says that you have to keep liberalizing all the time, otherwise you fall off your bicycle, does not recognize the realities of today's bicycles, especially as driven in Berkeley, which are driven backwards, sideways, and forwards. <laughs> so the notion that you always have to be liberalizing to have free trade, otherwise everything will collapse, I think is uh, misstated. Third, I, we, I believe that these Asian trade strategies are undergoing a tremendous shift away from an old institutional equilibrium, which I'll be talking about, which is focused on informal networks and <coughs> the GATT WTO system. And I think those changes are actually being driven in part by what the Europeans have been doing and what the U.S. has been doing, as one might expect. But I think some of the developments that we've seen are actually not very helpful in terms of stability of the global economy. And third, a fourth, I'll be talking about the need to develop a strategic vision, the vision thing, rather than simply talking about tactics. I, I go to lots of meetings in Washington and have had the privilege of doing that, and I always get the sense of what's hot and what's not. I initially thought the, t the, the presentation should be called Iraq and Trade, What's New? But then I decided <laughs> not to do that, just to attract a larger audience. <laughs> So let me talk about trade arrangements, and uh, this is the academic, so I won't spend too long. I, I just think it's very important to specify when we're talking about regionalism, what do we mean? Uh, people say regionalism is growing. Well, there are four kinds or five kinds of regionalism identified on this chart in yellow. The U.S.-Canada Auto Agreement, which is a bilateral agreement, is a kind of regionalism. So when people say regionalism, is that what they mean? Or do they mean that there are many products involved, like Australia, New Zealand, and some of the other trade agreements we've seen? Or are they talking about the illegal, initially, European coal and steel community, which uh, was also a form of regionalism? Are they talking about AFTA, NAFTA, and the EU? Or are they talking about this pink section, which is 
Asia Europe meetings, EU Mercosur, APEC, FTAA. All of those I've seen in the literature have been referred to as regionalism. And uh, this categorization suggests that we need to think about are there a lot of products involved or are there few products involved? And are we doing this on a unilateral, bilateral, minilateral, or multilateral basis? And also, are we talking about geographically concentrated or dispersed agreements? To further complicate the matter, one might look at sort of the red ones, which are protectionist, and the other ones in green, which are colors seem to have changed a little bit, but green, which are more liberalizing agreements. So the idea here is that different kinds of agreements are likely to have different effects. And my general research uh, that I've been doing here at the center and previously has to do with trying to explain why do these different types of arrangements arise? What is it that leads to the development of these arrangements? And not just economic factors, but political factors, lobbying by firms, uh, societal groups, and other groups as well. Second, how are these agreements likely to evolve? We seem to be so caught up in the idea that, well, this is going to be great, this agreement is good, let's work on the next one, let's work on the next one. We don't really think, well, what is the natural evolution? Is there some kind of cycle? Do you go from bilateralism to minilateralism to multilateralism? Do you revert and do you go the other way? People talk about the 19th century, I think, uh, in a very odd kind of way. They say, well, look, bilateralism worked then. Wasn't it great? Well, if you look at the 1930s, it wasn't so great. I mean, all of this bilateralism collapsed, there was no GATT WTO system, and bilateralism actually led to all sorts of problems. Third, what is the U.S. role, uh, since we're interested in U.S. policy, or I am interested in U.S. policy, in trade liberalization? Do U.S. actions make a big difference with respect to both trade liberalization and trade protection? We've seen the steel <coughs> protection, we've seen that go away, we've seen textile protection, we've seen all sorts of new kinds of arrangements as well. And finally, how do these different types of arrangements fit together? Will they all sort of be happily nested one with the other, or will they uh, be in conflict? We, we need to really understand what is likely to transpire over time, and by just focusing on one agreement after the other, or let's do big countries next, let's do medium countries next, I think we actually mislead uh, the analysis into trying to figure out what the big picture is about. Now, I must say, one of the favorite things uh, that I saw among many analysts and among many economists and many business people are these kinds of agreements, these information technology agreements. These are sector-specific agreements that have been de developed on a multilateral basis. And naturally, one might say, well, why wouldn't you expect this to develop? First is, when the WTO has problems, people look for two alternatives. Narrow the number of countries that are involved, or narrow the number of issues that's involved. And I don't think that's a bad idea, I do, but I just think we have to examine whether this kind of strategy is productive or not. As you can see, this top row of sectoralism has actually been used uh, quite a bit, but actually it's illegal. When I was saying the European Coal and Steel Company was illegal, I was quite serious. I meant illegal under Article 24 of the GATT WTO, which says that you cannot have sectoral agreements unless you have a commitment to making them broader, which cover all issues and the like. And one of the issues with respect to bilateral trade agreements is are they really covering all issues? Are they really liberalizing agreements as mandated by Article 24? And the big powers, US, EU, Japan, and so on, really don't want to tackle this very much. They talk about tackling it, but there's been no progress in the WTO in thinking about these issues. So let's talk about this bicycle theory of trade. Well, let's apply it to one case, which I am familiar with, which is these three agreements which we've seen in 1996, 1998, and 1999, which were kind of coming out of the uh, Uruguay round trade agreements. But they were li liberalizing agreements in information technology, telecom, and financial services. And they look pretty good. I mean, they liberalize in computer technology, telecom, financial services. As uh, one of my colleagues who actually helped negotiate the Belt Telecom Agreement, he says, Vinny, what more do you want? Well, I am a demanding kind of guy. I said, well, look, <laughs> there are advantages to these agreements. They follow the preferences of domestic business groups. They create tangible gains. This is the bicycle theory, when global or regional trade efforts stall. So here we might say, well, these are great things. And my former colleague, Laura Tyson, who was dean of the business school and who wrote about these agreements and spent some time in, in Washington, said that these are the agreements of the future. This is the good thing to have. Before that, she said, of course, that industrial policy was a good thing to have and strategic trade policy. This is her latest thing, that these are good things to have. I have my doubt.
open sectoralism buys off winners and therefore reduces the possibility of conducting future trade negotiations. So when people say, why are the WTO negotiations having a problem? We should do sectoralism, we should do something else. Maybe we should look at the agreements we've already negotiated. Maybe these agreements have delivered to the pro-trade groups, telecom, computer technology and financial services, precisely what they want. And therefore, it's no wonder when I go give talks in Silicon Valley in the Berkeley uh, Stanford area and I talk about the glories of the WTO, <laughs> they close their eyes and they nap. And when I finish that, they, and I said, you guys all seem to be napping, you're not paying attention to this, who cares about the WTO? We've got ITA. What we want to hear about is how should we get ITA to? And the telecom people say, how should we get telecom to? And I said, you should be out there in Washington fighting for free trade. You should be out there fighting those textile people, those agricultural and steel people. And they said, no, 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 we've already got what we want. So this, in my view, is a problem. And also, of course, we know from economics that if you have tariff reductions in sectors with low tariffs, you actually worsen distortions in other sectors like textiles, steel, and the like, and, and especially agriculture, which we've seen recently with the Farm Bill. Let me turn to this third point about what's going on in East Asia. From this chart, we can see that East Asians had a number of agreements. Most of these agreements were kind of, they did sign on to ITA, BTA, and all that. But this recent proliferation, and there is very recent, 2004, 2002, all these kind of new bilateral agreements, whether geographically concentrated, geographically dispersed, some now talk of minilateral agreements, some now talk about kind of other uh, hybrid kinds of agreements that are not even fitting on my chart. They're so complex of different actors and so on. And so I really do think we have a changing environment in East Asia. And so one of the puzzles I'm trying to address is how is this, a, 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 this environment changing and what were the factors that led to it? So the kind of work I'm doing is, is really in this area. So when we think about what future for East Asia, let's first specify what we had in the 80s and 90s. In my view, you had this informal network, overseas Chinese capitalism, Japanese Kiretsu networks throughout Southeast Asia, and ironically, the strong commitment to the GATT WTO system. After many years of lobbying, they finally bought what we told them. You should join the WTO, you should be an active part of it, and so on. Well, guess what? That's not exactly what's happening right now. We now see that there's interregionalism, there's regionalism, there's bilateralism, and in 2004, at least, the system is in high flux as to what will happen. The real puzzle, I think, is I picked the year 2020, although one can't really make predictions that far out, but 2020, of course, is the year that APEC said that we would have free trade <laughs> all over the region and uh, this sort of free trade uh, would be around on all over the Asia Pacific. So I sort of try to look at down the road what's likely to happen. Now when we look at bilateral trade agreements in particular, there have been some standard economic arguments. You get economies of scale, you can facilitate capital flows, you minimize costs. There are some very good arguments why you might want to have bilateral trade agreements, at least from this economic perspective. And from a security perspective, we can see that there's more to this than trade. There is often security motivations. The U.S. has negotiated a number of agreements, sort of vanguard of the opening that will open up these regions of the world to free trade and therefore democracy and therefore dot, dot, dot along Cordell Hall lines that democracy and, fr and free trade leads to peace. There's, uh, politically, these are great. Uh, I went to this talk just here at the Wilson Center a few days ago where the chiefs of staff were talking about U.S. trade policy and it was a very impressive talk and these people are obviously very capable but I was really struck by this, well, under my president, we negotiated the following three agreements. And somebody said, well, they were negotiated under yours, but they were ratified under mine. Everybody's out there trying to take credit for every agreement. What better than to have a bilateral agreement that you can start with a little country and also negotiate it and get it through the Congress, and then you can take full credit no. for the agreement that you have rather than to have it sharing it with God knows Republicans or with Democrats, depending on your political affiliation. Of course, this also strengthens the power of dominant power. It starts with bargaining power. The reason we had the WTO and, and some of the vision that the U.S. had was that maybe if you diffuse power, these countries will be more interested and cooperative. We are now moving to a situation where everyone is dying to negotiate with the Japanese and with the Americans and the EU. If you're a small country, you will get a temporary advantage 
And of course you would like to have a bilateral trade agreement with a big country, you've got market access to that country. Don't ask what happens five years down the road when you've made all these investments and you suddenly find that new competitors have come on because they've negotiated a bilateral agreement. So some of these agreements may actually mislead uh, business groupings into thinking that they've locked in something that's very promising. These also help unlock and reform. They also may spread through this kind of policy bandwagoning. That's the uh, philosophy of competitive liberalization. And uh, they're often used by some countries as training exercises for the next big country. Uh, the Koreans have often said, we're picking this small country, the Chileans, as our training country. Uh, the <laughs> Koreans and the Chileans didn't particularly appreciate this view of that the Koreans are just training with them. Uh, realistically <laughs> speaking, there were, of course, good reasons to have a Korea-Chile Korea agreement. They were in the southern hemisphere, so with respect to agricultural trade, there appeared to be a less direct threat. And there's actually very little trade between Chile and Korea, so that also solves the problem of major domestic restructuring. So some of the games that are being played by the US are, of course, being imitated by the Koreans and everybody else who are quick learners in how to play this game of these kinds of agreements. So the real question and the, the issue that's quite interesting is, what will be the new equilibrium? As I mentioned, the old equilibrium was this kind of market-driven informal integration plus GATT WTO. So that's at the national nation state level, and at the sub-multilateral level, you have these kinds of agreements. Well, what happened? Several things. End of the Cold War, which changed the dynamics in Asia between the United States and the uh, now former Soviet Union. Emergence of China in terms of economic co competition in the global markets. China has been around uh, for a long time, as many people know. But in terms of trade, China be began to take this very dominant position, especially in the last few years. And their actions, for example, with respect to currency devaluation has a clear spillover effect onto countries, in, for example, the ASEAN countries and others in the region. Growing economic interdependence in East Asia, that's not exactly a shock. That's kind of an emerging property of some of the policies that we've seen. And the real shock, of course, was the financial crisis of 1997-1998, which began, to, I think, to call into question this strategy of this export orientation towards Western markets, could you just rely on that? And maybe there was no uh, financial mechanism, and I won't go into that, but in terms of financial mechanisms to help Asians, as you know, the US was actively dissuading the Japanese from developing an alternative, some kind of AMF in the region. And I think that also set the Asians on this particular new institutional trajectory. So I haven't presented all this kind of uh, more formal analysis. I'll just uh, review a couple of the outcomes of these arguments. One is with respect to goods. What kinds of goods are being sought? Public goods, private goods? I think there's a certain public good aspect to the WTO, although it's kind of a club good at one level. But if you negotiate these bilateral trade agreements and you have asset specificity and you're worried about guaranteed markets, the logical strategy is try to lock up key markets for your industrialists, entrepreneurs, and the like. And I think that became the new emerging philosophy in Asia, East Asia particularly. Second, new developments, changes in domestic regimes, uh, changing societal pressures, pressures on agriculture, but most importantly, changing perceptions about the benefits of multilateralism. Academics, both in the United States, in Europe, and in Asia, began to write, well, maybe this is not the only way to go. Maybe there are better ways to go, and some Washington people have had an influence in this changing perception, which has therefore led to a different view in Japan, in China, in Korea, as to what kinds of policies might be followed and what you might do. So I think here now, uh, Asian countries have been looking for an insurance policy. So the idea is let's develop some kind of insurance policy, let's move towards agreements. APEC has not delivered the goods despite my APEC Study Center's major <laughs> efforts in this regard. And therefore you must really find some alternative to APEC, some alternative to pure links to the EU and the US because ASIM hasn't delivered the goods either. So what have been the preferences of, let's just look at three uh, major actors, I want, we can talk about ASEAN later on, but Japan, for example, began to see bilateral agreements as a way of doing some industrial restructuring given its long recession. Second, it also saw that general bilaterals were preferable because Japan wanted to link up to all these different regions. It's a global player, it's been a global economy. It did not want to be simply stuck, especially given it's a sometimes tense political relations with China and South Korea in just that region. 
And it negotiated this ASEAN agreement clearly reactively, as my colleague Kent Calder at SAIS says, you know, Japan is a reactive player. It was not proactive. And when the Chinese negotiated their ASEAN pact, that of course led to this kind of pressure on Japan. China has been so busy thinking about the WTO that when I talk to various Chinese officials, they don't want to talk about these other things. However, they are moving, it seems to me, in that direction under pressure. They've basically not seen general bilaterals as very interesting. They are not negotiating with Chile, to my knowledge. They are not negotiating with Peru or Burundi or Morocco or Bahrain. And they are actually focusing on the WTO. Ironically, now, all the things that we always told them to do, they're actually doing. And they did negotiate this ASEAN pact, I think, that had its origins, again, in the Asian financial crisis, these concerns that devaluations and so on would be shocked, the fact that China is more and more competitive vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN. And therefore, ASEAN countries, I think, had a kind of both economic and political nervousness that I think the Chinese sought to assuage with these kinds of agreements. And finally, South Korea has focused, as I mentioned, on these lightweight partners. And they do, are trying to develop kind of a bilateral accord, maybe with the US, maybe with China, and have talked a lot about a Northeast Asian free trade agreement, have had various meetings, East Asian Trade Forum, trying to develop a kind of PEC-like organization, if you know about that, which was a kind of intellectual uh, grouping that advised kind of APEC on how to evolve and how to develop. So now let me conclude uh, with these various uh, scenarios and I look forward to the comments. So my view is we start with these kind of general bilaterals, which is what's going on in Asia. And of course we could just end up with more general bilaterals, but let's think of some of the things that are likely to happen. What happens, uh, I think Kent Calder has pointed this out, what happens if there's more security conflict? What happens if there's more pressure of strengthening economic relationships because of uh, economic problems and maybe in the US or what have you? Then you might see, in fact, this kind of movement towards sub-regionalism, Northeast Asian free trade agreement, which would overcome what I think is an inherent nervousness about moving forward with this trilateral agreement. And I believe that that agreement would be kind of nested within the WTO, it would fit with the WTO, it would be more classic Article 24 kind of agreement, although it may not be called that, but I think it would fit more like the NAFTAs of the world than as some kind of uh, other agreement. This kind of agreement is sort of, if you want, cycling on uh, forward. If we do see this regionalization of Northeast Asia, and we do see this uh, Europe and America's regionalization, you might see pressure within East Asia to have some kind of link between ASEAN plus three. And there's already talk about that all right, already. And ASEAN plus three might evolve into a serious East Asian free trade agreement. Now there's a question, if that develops, are we now in a world where we don't need the WTO? Or will these, in fact, trans-regional agreements be well hooked up within the WTO? I think that's an open question still, but I think there could be some tension with the WTO if we move in that direction. And here's my optimist. I have to give you some optimism here. What happens if there is an increasing sense of awareness? The upside of East Asian regionalization might well be that APEC and ASEM could be strengthened. And there's a certain irony here, because basically you think that maybe APEC is declining and that I should change the name of my center to the Berkeley <laughs> Asia Pacific <laughs> Study Center and forget about economic cooperation. I was prepared for that several years ago, worrying that APEC would dissolve, but I still need to use the initials of my center. Stationary is expensive. And so therefore, you might have APEC or ASEM being enhanced. That is, if East Asians feel confident that they have their own grouping, as they've often said, and you see various pronouncements, well, the Americans are doing it, the Europeans are doing it, their Europeans are widening, Americans are looking south, we should have an agreement too. And the previous view that, that uh, was being rejected by the United States very actively through pressure on the Japanese and other pressure, of having Matir's kind of East Asian regional grouping and then East Asian caucus as a result of this pressure, no one seems to be worried about that anymore, at least as far as from my conversations. People say, fine, fine, we're doing this, well, they can have it. Well, that's what they were saying some time ago, but I think this is a matter of some concern. Where, where will this grouping go? Will it really become part of APEC, ASEM, and interregional groupings? And will these groupings then just completely substitute for the WTO? If you have this nice interregional connection between Europe and the US, the US and Asia and Asia and Europe, the triad, well, that's enough. Okay, well, if you're an African country, well, 
I'm sure we'll be able to come up with something for you guys. And if you're South Asian, well, maybe you can hook up at some time. But basically, the triad's covered, and who needs the WTO? I believe that this direction, actually, although it sounds promising, may end up eventually completely margining, marginalizing the WTO. Finally, and here's the uh, sort of Washington consensus on trade, not on finance, which is that this is all just a political signaling game. We negotiate bilateral after bilateral, creates a little trade diversion, people want to sign up with us, and guess what? Next you know, WTO is enhanced, nested links, and 10 years from now, it'll just be a big joke, oh, all those bilaterals didn't mean, really mean anything, we're going to all expire, and we're going to be left with a nice, free, liberal WTO, which was accomplished through bilateral trade agreements. That's the optimistic scenario. I do have my doubts about that, and I'm sure we can talk about that during question period. The more pessimistic one is the one I think that Bhagwati has raised, which is that there'll be a race to the bottom among contending bilaterals, and that bilateral trade agreements will lead to pernicious bilateralism, and that pernicious bilateralism will therefore undermine the WTO, and you'll have conflicting agreements. Unlike Bhagwati, however, I want to go beyond the let's just dump on bilateral agreements, and therefore I've tried to present kind of the political dynamics that might lead to other kinds of agreements, not simply say these are bad, 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 and some people say these are good, good, good. I'm not sure that discussion goes very far besides uh, you get to go to a lot of conferences and there's a pro and a con. But, uh, but beyond that, I think it's more interesting to analyze these dynamics. I've tried to do this. I don't know if I've succeeded. And I leave it to Paula and Gary to comment on my effort here and uh, talk more generally about East Asian regional integration. So thank you, Ken. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, Ken, thank you for inviting me, and uh, Vinny, thanks for a very provocative uh, statement. As, as this shows, not only can Vinny write faster than any of us can read, but he can also talk and show PowerPoints faster than we can think, or at least faster than I can think. So uh, um, my, uh, my remarks, I, I should have insisted on getting the slideshow you know, a week ago while I was traveling, but I wasn't a good enough negotiator. Um, so uh, my remarks will have kind of a rambling uh, uh, effect to them, but fortunately I only have eight minutes left now. Now, the first remark is that uh, the system that we know and love, the WTO and so forth, is, of course, as, as Vinny has pointed out, it's, uh, it's in a state of atrophy, if not, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> near death. But world trade is doing quite well. And the U.S. certainly deserves a lot of blame for, um, I don't know, blame or credit for, uh, for what's happening to the WTO. Uh, but the U.S. also deserves a lot of credit for um, pumping up world trade because, after all, we are running a $500 billion trade deficit. And while that has other aspects which are unfortunate, there's no doubt it is a big boost to the world economy. And if you look at the stats, trade is just doing wonderfully well. So I think a big question we have to ask those of us in the kind of system business ask ourselves, and I'm sure you don't have the answer, is whether is how long can the, can the trading world go on, and, and I also mean the investment world and the good recovery of FDI, and of course financial capital is doing very well, probably too well right now, but uh, without, you know, further system development. And it may be a fairly long period of time, or maybe if the system doesn't come along pretty quickly, um, we'll get all sorts of bad things in the years ahead. Now, the, um, <clears throat> the second point I would make is that, um, um, you know, what uh, Vinnie has said about the bicycle theory, that's uh, heresy over at 1750 Massachusetts Avenue. So. <laughs> Next time he comes, he won't get any dessert. He may not even get lunch. So, <laughs> but he knows full well the penalties of heresy. Now, there are other people who are heretics around about, even some in the building, and and he may be right that uh, you know this bicycle theory has been greatly oversold. And he's showing what's happened with the ITA and the <coughs> and the basic telecom agreements and so forth, which is not much has happened in terms of follow-on. And he's raised a lot of provocative questions about how these uh, <coughs> bilaterals will or will not develop. Uh, my, my challenge to him, and this is really an academic challenge, I think he's on the way, but um, what, what we want in this world is something 
akin to what uh, his colleague Andrew Rose has done on analyzing whether the WTO matters. Now, I take issue with Andrew Rose's econometrics, and if you haven't looked at it, this is not the place to discuss it. But I do think he's made a good contribution in terms of uh, beginning to uh, lay out the uh, kind of a panel econometric analysis of, you know, did the WTO create trade or not? Uh, I should uh, mention that over at uh, the uh, IMF, there are a couple of economists who are taking serious issue with him, but that's very good. It provokes a debate. And I think Vinny has the makings here of, you know, is the bicycle theory or when is it uh, a hoax and when is it not? When does the bicycle go backwards? When does it fall over and so forth? But I think it needs, he's got some good stories, but I think it needs some systematic, uh, I don't know, quantitative analysis. And I certainly don't have the methodology here, but that is just the kind of the big question of the day. And I suspect the answer will be some kind of bicycles move forward, but a lot, uh, a lot don't, and then trying to parse the, uh, the universe be between them. Next point on kind of bicycles that don't move forward, his trip to, to Silicon Valley, um, which I'm sure he had a good consulting fee as well as, uh, you know, educating them. I hope he did. Um, with these PowerPoints, Vinny, you should be paid quite a bit per hour. In any event, you know, what, what, I, think, um, what I think one could conclude on kind of this, uh, you, you know, taking away the energy from the, from the winners, one should not look just at the uh, at the uh, tariffs on their output or the restrictions on their their market access. One should also consider the uh, the restrictions which are cost raising on their inputs. And this, of course, goes back to Ava Lerner, which is a very long time ago, back to 1936. But there are even limitations on what Abel Runner said, which was basically that an import tariff is an export tax, and therefore industry should uh, should work more on the import side of the agenda. Now, industries have been very slow to learn that, and that's because business schools, until many came along, weren't teaching these, uh, these bright young people the right things. But now they are getting the idea, and that's, that is um, – Influencing that, but when you take semiconductors and telecoms, you kind of ask what their inputs are. Well, they certainly want to be able to outsource, and they're fighting that battle pretty well. I mean, so there they are on the liberalizing side of the agenda in a completely different battle. But I'll tell you where they're not and where the system is stalled are inputs which are principally consumed by consumers, you and me and Paula here. Uh, and that's why it's been so hard to do anything about sugar or across a broad range of agriculture or for that matter clothing although textiles since textiles are an input to clothing there the liberalization there is going much faster and that's pretty important and, and maybe we're going to end up with a system where the consumer goods or at least certain of them are um, going on just yesterday I was at a breakfast where I was sitting next to a lobbyist for the um, food processing and uh, food processing industries, those are big ice cream makers and candy makers and what have you, food makers. And yeah, yeah, they're fighting the battle on sugar and dairy, and uh, she agreed that she'll be doing this until she retires, and she's fairly young. I mean, there are not enough people in those industries, even though you have Coca-Cola in that group, to combat the sugar folk or the dairy folk. But, uh, but I wouldn't be so pessimistic on industrial inputs more generally. Now, let's see, what else? I'll maybe only make one other comment and then stop and turn it over to Paula to pull it together into some coherent fashion. Um, I mean, this this business of what's going on in East Asia, Vinny knows that better than I think almost any other scholar, and I uh, have not studied it and don't have his insights, but, but what I would throw out as a possibility is this. I mean, it's really a question mark how much gets driven by economics and how much by politics and the political agenda in within East and, and South Asia. If it's an economic agenda, it will be a larger China, starting with unilateral free trade, learning from the United States and Europe, and then becoming reciprocal. And we will see that in the years ahead. Now, if, it, if the competition takes on quite a bit of security overtones, which it could do, uh, I think the possible surprise around the corner is an India-Japan alliance. 
trade alliance, but obviously with the security counterbalancing, you know, who in, in Asia. And that would then be a very different uh, picture in the future. But for now, it seems to me that economics is, is, uh, is leading the game on these regional, even though it's oftentimes a kind of perverse economics rather than a, a security story. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for including me in this esteemed company of Vinny and Gary and Kent. Um, I can't think of three people in the trade field I uh, respect any more and really have great affection towards. Um, so, Vinny, you have brought us together. Uh, I think it's going to be a love feast because um, at least uh, Gary was, I think, very kind on you, even if you did, you know, express this heresy on the bicycle theory. Um, and as for, for me, I, I thought you, your paper was fabulous. Um, you know, Bhagwati speaks of the spaghetti bowl that you've uh, been uh, talking about for us. And uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, what Vinny has done is he's become the Cuisinart uh, for trade <laughs> management <laughs> arrangements. He has sliced it and he has diced it and he <laughs> has pre presented a delectable uh, culinary presentation um, and intellectually it makes an awful lot of good sense. Um, and um, I, I would uh, like to kind of comment on my take on this uh, issue of trade management, bilateralism, multilateralism, uh, regionalism, and how they all kind of fit or don't fit together. Um, I believe I, 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 there was really nothing in, in your paper, Vinny, that I could take uh, exception to. Um, I think that the, the biggest story is China. Um, I guess I would have liked to have seen, you know, another step back after you had done all the slicing and dicing um, because I think the big difference between Asia, if you will, um, uh, as a player in, in the last 50 years uh, in the multilateral scene is that Asia had a silent partner. It was called Japan. Um, Asia just never it, it really showed any leadership in the multilateral realm. Uh, the, it was the U.S. and it was Europe, um, which were the necessary and sufficient partners to advance multilateralism. And um, now what we have, I think, is the emergent China. And so the question becomes, is in the next 50 or 60 years, that the key. And I think China will be the fulcrum there. They're very proud after 15 years, of course, of becoming a member of the WTO. And as you point out in your paper, that you know, a lot of their energy um, has been in that area. Yet I think they're extremely adroit uh, diplomatically uh, and uh, have demonstrated already now in the trade diplomacy world uh, that they are adroit, uh, while uh, they played an interesting role. I think it'll make a good dissertation for somebody to write, I hope, one day when they get behind the scenes. Um, in the uh, G20, mm -hmm. and uh, what the G20 uh, did, in effect, to demonstrate that um, the U.S. and Europe, and if you will, the Quad, uh, Canada and, and Japan, were not sufficient anymore. But whereas before they were necessary and sufficient to push multilateralism, the G20 demonstrated that wasn't enough. And I think that China is, uh, we don't know exactly what role they play, but I, uh, nor do we know what role they will play. But if I were betting right now, I think they're going to play a very interesting um, uh, constructive 
role because they understand that not only are they one of the largest exporters in the world, but they, unlike any other nation that the U.S. has had to deal with, they're the lar potentially the largest importer or consumer. And um, they have an enormous stake in, in, in a constructive outcome of this, uh, of the man trade management, as, as you call it, and I think that's the right word, because that's what we're talking about, is managing trade. I mean, um, the, the point, of course, is that um, uh, economists uh, prefer unilateral liberalization as the first best option to trade liberalization. Um, but uh, if you can't get that uh, in a world of nation states, um, you do what the U.S. has employed, I think very cleverly uh, to, to date, uh, and that is you pursue multilateralism. And um, uh, that is the next best option. Um, in the past uh, few decades, the U.S. has in turned increasingly toward bilateral and regional trade pacts. They've excused it. And I'm not saying anything new here because Vinny really has covered the waterfront in his paper. He's even br brought up all of these points. So none of these are criticisms. This is just, I guess, a reformulation as I see the same world that he was describing. But they've, you know, justified this uh, use of bilateral and regional to prod the multilateral negotiations. In the late 80s, the completion of the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement helped launch the Uruguay round, and then later the extension of the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement to bring in Mexico and form the NAFTA to help revitalize the stalled Uruguay round. Um, and going back into that history, um, the, Bu the Bush One administration history that I've just described, um, also uh, towards the end of its uh, period in office, envisioned the Enterprise for the Americas initiative. Um, that would grow the NAFTA south to include Chile and other South American countries. In that particular period, historically, uh, I was serving as the senior trade advisor to then candidate Clinton and really tr emphasized in a lot of my writings uh, the need for U.S. national interests. And I, excuse me, but any time I talk about world issues, I always talk about it from the U.S. national interest. I'm just that kind of person. Um, but I felt the need that we to extend, you know, not only south, but east to Asia Pacific. And then President Clinton, incoming, had this wonderful opportunity with that APEC meeting uh, that he hosted in 1993 in uh, Seattle to si signal the importance of that region. Um, and I think that was absolutely the right thing to do. Um, in doing so, um, both with the APEC summit implying a somewhat of a shift in commercial ties to the Asia Pacific, plus the NAFTA being implemented and uh, going through Congress, um, sent a signal to the Europeans that they were going to get marginalized even more. And again, I think that, you know, that has constantly been this effort to try to push the Europeans, uh, particularly on the agricultural subsidy issue, which has been our biggest stumbling block, um, I think, to real progress at the multilateral level. Um, and of course, there have been subsequent APIC meetings during in, historically, which were the opportunity to prod along multilateralism, the ITA, the Information Technology Agreement, et cetera. And I don't know, I, I, this may be my own personal perspective, but I remember that the information technology agreement really started with a bilateral between the U.S. and Japan um, to eliminate duties on semiconductors, uh, computers and then semiconductors, and then it got built into uh, something else. Um, so uh, it's another example of uh, uh, where these things can be benign, but as you pointed out, um, they, could, they can buy off supporters. I don't, I don't really, that's the one thing I think I may take issue with you on this. Yes, it buys off supporters. Um, and, um, but on the other hand, I believe that you, you need to, any liberalization is good. 
and um, so you go for the free for for the low hanging fruit. Um, I mean, you could argue, for example, in India, um, they've got a whole sector there which is much more free than the rest of the uh, of the economy. But it's a demonstration effect um, that they need to be liberalizing the rest of the economy if they want to get the information technology, uh, productivity, and benefits. Um, so I, I I don't mind being opportunistic. Uh, I think it's pragmatic and, and it can have a demonstration effect. So I guess to that extent I do take some, some issue with you. Um, but <coughs> now let me just bring us up. <coughs> Excuse me. To Bush too. And um, uh, Trade Representative Zellick, who is, continues to pursue both the bilateral and the multilateral. I mean, this is, it's a continuation of the decades-long dual-track approach to trade negotiations. Um, I think what's kind of added um, to, to our new flavor of American bilateralism is that we are less interested in kind of the commercial bottom line getting any bang for the buck and we're just more interested in the bang bang because <laughs> what we're doing is um, you know trying to find candidates uh, among the coalition of the willing mm -hmm. in this uh, 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 geostrategic challenge that the president is preoccupied with and he of course has reached out to Morocco and Bahrain and Abu Dhabi or uh, UAE not, not just the Abu Dhabi Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia. And so you really are getting a foreign policy priority, which is quite different from what you're describing in, uh, for the most part in, 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 in East Asia. Uh, I mean, that's, that's not uh, surprising given our history and given the, the, uh, the history, as I said, of um, Asia vis-a-vis -vis multilateralism. It just hasn't had that kind of a leadership role that takes into account geostrategic and other matters. It has only been, as you said, these informal commercial considerations. <clears throat> I just came from one meeting. I was over at the Atlantic Council where I'm um, chairing, uh, co-chairing with Bo Cutter uh, a study on transatlantic economies in the year 2020 and what is it going to look like. And um, so uh, I, I do think it's worth bearing, you know, r repeating that um, Europe and the U.S. together were the engine of global economic growth and the engine for multilateral trade liberalization and management. Um, now, as you point out, um, Vinny, the East Asia is shifting its preference uh, towards these bilateral agreements. Um, and uh, in doing so, I think it underscores the need, of course, for a, a, a much stronger WTO um, governance principles. You refer to Article 24, and I think, you know, we've had an awful lot of attention to everything else, um, dispute settlement mechanisms and uh, being the most prominent that came out of the Uruguay round. But I think that one of the greatest challenges um, is uh, having some way to assure that there's going to be harmonization, I don't know if you call it nesting or, or, or sometimes the vocabulary, I'm not quite sure the difference between nesting and horizontal links. But in any case, um, the good stuff, you need to have some harmonization to assure that this proliferation of, of bilaterals um, um, is uh, providing a greater liberalization um, rather than the spaghetti bowl effect um, where, of course, the rules of origin is the, the spaghetti bowl nightmare where you have this zillion different rules of origin and any one exporter or importer will, can't figure out, you know, uh, how to fill out the forms, the customs forms for any, any transaction. Um, as I said, I think you have underestimated China um, and uh, its uh, present and future level of involvement in regional trade agreements, which could change the whole dynamics 
of the East Asia integration and, and, and of the multilateral process. Um, I, I go back, I, I guess, to the history uh, that I, the statements that I made 12, 13 years ago. Um, the need for the U.S. to recognize East Asia's importance um, uh, in our trade diplomacy. I don't think it's again. I think we're kind of hung up on on the coalition of the willing, um, and uh, I think that there's just enormous activity going on in East Asia. If you, as you have demonstrated in your presentation, Benny, um, and I think that the U.S. Trade diplomats should be actively promoting uh, its inclusion in any open Asia trade agreements um, to assure that Asian bilateral agreements have a benign long term effect uh, on the multilateral trading system. Uh, U.S. regional trade policies should encourage deeper links with Asia. Uh, as I said back 14 years ago, I spoke about. Um, Chile uh, being a, uh, that we needed a bilateral with Chile because I never, well, that was late, that was uh, less time ago. I thought we would never, Chile would never become a member of NAFTA and they needed to give that up and have them have a bilateral. That happened. But back later in 93, I spoke of uh, Singapore being the first candidate for expanding as a stepping stone um, uh, the U.S. links uh, that it, in activities. Uh, for a vision for a wider Asian agreement. Um, and so I'm glad that the Bush administration now has wrapped up the free trade agreements with both Singapore and with Chile. Um, and you can ex extend these links um, by accession. You can extend them by merger. Maybe that's what you call horizontal links. I was trying to get my vocabulary, as I had articulated this in the past, with, with your vocabulary. Um, and if I've got the terms off, you know, I'm sure you, you understand what I'm saying. Maybe the rest of the group doesn't. Um, I want to uh, say, Vinny, that you should not give up on APEC. <laughs> that uh, APEC could play a role, I think, as an important consultation mechanism that would bring together the members from ASEAN and the members from NAFTA. I mean, after all, if you look at APEC, it, it, you know, you have those overlapping memberships. Um, so I think it could become a useful asset to nest future trade agreements and to assure open regionalism. And um, with that, uh, I, I want to thank you again for including me in, in this group. Uh, I know you have, were looking for a really good title up there, you and Kent. Um, the one I thought you should use is Sex, Lies, Iraq, and Trade. <laughs> <laughs> that way, you know, I think you'll get really even a bigger audience. <laughs> well, before we jump to questions, I think we ought to give Vinny a brief chance to respond that he's been accused of being a heretic. And <laughs> although Paula is polite as ever, ever, I got a sense that she thought that He'd not only fallen off the bicycle, but maybe off the wagon as well. <laughs> so, Vinny, why don't you take a couple minutes and just respond, and then we'll go right to questions. Well, uh, I don't want to take too much time because I'm looking forward to the questions, but I, I, I appreciate the comments, and I, I do see the heresy, and I guess I'll never be invited to IAE again. But, but, but I one has been to take this. For years, so well, there, you're, you're, you showed your heresy long before me. Exactly, so. you know. <laughs> No, I, I just think that this uh, concern with uh, bilateralism and, and Jeff Schott's book launch, well, now we should do big countries, and Zelik came there and he said, well, show me how to do big countries, and that was the end of it. So, I mean, I think this mm -hmm. kind of, that is kind of short-sighted. We need to think of a broader strategic perspective. I haven't given up on APEC. I do think those kinds of organizations, trans-regional organizations, do solve some of those problems. 
I, I do think you both indirectly agreed with me that the problem of moving forward with this bicycle, for example, on open sexual agreements, is that in fact these industries are not lobbying against agricultural steel and textiles. I fully agree they're lobbying on outsourcing and on their inputs, which you might expect them to do since it directly affects their bottom line. I, I really think the problem is when you're building coalitions for free trade, as was done historically in the United States over the last 200 years, we know we've always had to build a coalition for free trade. We sometimes forget about that. We forget about the political economy of coalition building in our excitement to liberalize particular sectors. And some people misinterpret this as to say, oh, you don't want liberalization. Of course I want liberalization, but sometimes if you get all the low-hanging fruit, the tree dies, and that's it. And so my view is, don't just focus on the low-hanging fruit. Think of what the implications are of your actions. I'm not guaranteeing you that they're never going to fight for free trade, but I do think you're giving them an incentive not to by creating these kinds of arrangements. Does that mean you should not have negotiated them? No, you can negotiate the arrangements on a contingent basis. Say, you will get this, but then I expect to see you at the following 47 meetings in terms of lobbying, in terms of your presence, in terms of your alliance and coalition building process, and not just be worrying about your particular imports and maybe outsourcing. And I think we haven't done enough of that. And if we do really want to build a coalition for trade, for free trade, we can't just give certain sectors what they want. And I'll just end with one interesting comparison. Kennedy, in 1961, 1962, when faced with exactly the problem of getting the Kennedy round going, which came to be known as the Kennedy round, which of course was the most significant round in trade negotiations of the post-war period, and maybe even historically the most significant round, even more significant than uh, Tokyo, clearly more significant than that. <coughs> what did he do? He bought off the textile industry. He bought off a potential opponent to protectionism, and then he got them out of the way so he could move forward. What we've done now is diametrically the opposite. We bought off the ones who would, in fact, be proponents for free trade and left us, left at textiles, agriculture, and steel as the key players in this town. And I often say, well, wait till next year. It's going to be really exciting. Everybody says the multi-fiber arrangement is going to end. Don't count on, it. count on it. This is the time I regret I didn't go, into, go to law school, as I was thinking of doing. But since you're a lawyer, maybe you and I can start a firm. There are going to be so many anti-dumping suits next year, you will not believe it. I hope someone will call me. And this is going to be the future for the next five years. So this whole notion of that, well, you know, textiles are going away, everything's going to be fine, they're going to be a play, play a big role. And this will lead to great tensions, and I fully agree with China, who is our key trading partner right now, and I think this will lead to major tensions, and I don't think we're addressing this issue. We're sort of thinking, well, you know, according to the WTO, this is supposed to disappear at the end of 2004, we'll have to appreciate it in 2005. This will have dramatic effects on developing countries, on Bangladesh, on Mexico, all of whom have developed apparel industries and textile industries and are not ready for free trade. And so we're going to see all of these kinds of strange coalitions of Mexicans and American and ATMI following, uh, pursuing anti-dumping actions, pursuing safeguard actions. And then somebody said, well, how do you know all this? I said, well, it's very simple. I go to the ATMI website. Their strategy is right on their webpage. <laughs> so I'll just end with that. <laughs> Uh, can I just on this? I, I think that the low hang. I think that's a great metaphor. That if you get all the low hanging fruit, then you know you, the tree may die. Um, but I think one of the reasons why you didn't get politically the kind of clout um, for you know from the business community has less to do with the fact that they got everything they wanted at the ITA then it has to do with additional factors. It's, life is always complicated, so I mean, but the other factors are they got, they got sucked into all these bilaterals. They spent, you know, for example, mm -hmm. Caterpillar mm -hmm. spent its time, you know, on with Australia and with Chile and all these different, you know, series of these smaller things. And, you know, there's just so much time that, you know, yeah. one trade person can do. And, 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 I, and I think that, that that is another, you know, uh, reason why, and I, I don't think it has to do with that. Moreover, you didn't have any leadership at the White House. Yeah. Um, so I, I just yeah. don't think you can hang it on the fact that an ITA got negotiated and they got everything they wanted there. Yeah, let me just say one point. I, I agree with you. That's, that's actually my point about bilaterals, that bilaterals are actually going the same, they do the same thing 
as open sectoralism does. Mm -hmm. It buys some of these people off because they get s very specific things that they want with countries. So open sectoralism is okay, a, so sort of an example. The same, point. Uh, the same thing is going to happen. So it's not that I'm like Bhagwati says all these things are bad because you get a spaghetti bowl. Mm -hmm. I think it's more fundamental than that. I think you're undermining political coalitions that otherwise would be okay. active. And I think your caterpillar example demonstrates it very okay, well. Okay, so your point is not just on sectoral no, bilaterals, no. but I also mean, the on next step in Asia and the next step that we're following. And therefore, I think that leaves open this huge Asian market where they will be pursuing these arrangements and we're not paying any attention to them because we're so busy with these, some sect with these bilaterals, not sectoral in this case, but narrow in terms of countries. Okay. And, I, and I do agree with your point that if, you know, if we're following Bahrain and this and that and the Asians are developing China and Japan and Korea, hello, we're here too. And I think that's what we're forgetting. Yeah. I'll stop there. Let's go right to questions. Yes, sir. Uh, Louis Cohen with Toys R Us. Um, I'm very much taken by the arguments that you put forward, uh, Vinny. I think they were very well put and uh, would tend very much to agree with, with much of what you said. I would only say that in terms of your, your uh, taxonomy at the beginning, I think when you look at uh, the various kinds of agreements, it's important to get another level down. I mean, if you look at US-Australia, for example, uh, it's a, a flawed agreement in many ways. Um, and I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that one FTA is not like another FTA, is not like a third FTA. They're, they're not homogeneous in the sense of a achieving a similar result uh, across a similar range of products. And I think that's a, a, another danger that we, we, we're running into. Um, the need to approach uh, the, the, the problem by looking at maybe not so low-hanging fruit. You know, I'm thinking of a U.S.-Japan FTA, which was a heresy uh, and probably still is, but I think it's, it is a possibility, assuming the WTO, uh, like Gary said, is, is, is in the process of atrophying. Um, if, if it is stalled, because we can't address these very difficult, sensitive issues of, of agricultural anti-dumping and, 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 and whatever else, uh, the the idea of negotiating uh, an FTA with a major Asian market, I mean, I think we have a, a kind of FTA with China. It's sort of tacit. Uh, there's no agreement, but, you know, in effect, we're, we're, we are uh, the consumers, they are the producers, and there's not much barrier to, to, to Chinese stuff coming in or U.S. investment go, uh, going into China. Uh, with Japan, it's another story. I think there are still possibilities to exploit, and I think the Japanese probably have a security reason for not wanting to be embraced wholly in the Chinese orbit. Uh, and to the extent that you could add Japan uh, to uh, North America, um, not in the sense of uh, an agreement which is homogeneous, so Japan would not become part of NAFTA. Eventually, that might be possible. You could see an Asia-Pacific, U.S.-Japan, U.S.-Australia, et cetera, and the barriers eventually among all of those countries starting to come down. But I would think, you know, as a second best solution from the point of view of the United States, looking at Japan as a possibility. You know, I was fascinated with the Japan-India idea also. Um, I wonder in the wake of the Indian election whether that's going to be anything that people are going to be looking at very soon. Anyway, I'd, I'd love to have your comments on that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think your point's well taken about the sectoral nature in some cases of bilateral free trade agreements. Uh, from a political economy perspective, I think bilateral trade agreements are somewhat better than open sectoralism. Why? Because bilateral agreements which bring together multiple industries leads to a kind of coalition building process in the, you need to construct a coalition to get that bilateral agreement through. So that could be better. However, if these agreements start having sectoral components and doing specific things for specific firms, and that's what they often look like, at least in my estimation, a lot of these are not entirely clear what they're going to do, then I think what you're doing is a similar thing to the open sectoralism. You're actually undermining the coalition. Certain firms are left out. They feel unhappy. They then will go to the next country and say, okay, this time it's our turn. That is a recipe for true fragmentation. I wouldn't call it spaghetti bowl. I'm, think, I'm thinking sp fragmentation of these agreements, and of, if, if the WTO is atrophying, it was atrophying precisely because of some of these elements. 
And in terms of negotiating and the U.S. negotiating these agreements, we have to remember when you were saying that, well, they're so busy, they don't have time. I, you know, I was, last year I was advising WTO on, on, on trade negotiations. I was working with trade negotiators on how to do trade negotiations. And there are about 65 developing country trade negotiators. Mm -hmm. And I really felt pity for them at the end of the course. I mean, one guy was very sharp. He says to me on the dispute settle mechanism, how does it work on day three? I said, you shouldn't be in this course. You know too much. He had a law degree from Georgetown. And I said, why are you here? And another woman from a country I won't mention says to me, well, that was a very interesting, Professor. But can you repeat again, what is free trade? And I looked at her. I said, were you paying any attention? She goes, well, I also do the WTO. I'm also here for the ITU. I'm also here for, and she named 12 organizations. And I said, no wonder she doesn't understand what's going on. She's responsible for all of this. If you think USTR has a problem because they can't get enough people to go to the negotiations and they're worried about it, just think of, of some small country that we have now picked as the next uh, partner for us and then start talking about sector specific. This is great boomtown now for training. Everywhere I go, OAS is doing training, mm -hmm. WTO is doing training, and I finally said to somebody, I said, is there anybody coordinating all this training, or are you training the same seven people on how to negotiate? I mean, and he said, no, actually, we haven't thought about this, because every organization wants to get in the training business, because there's so many agreements being negotiated, it's boom time in Washington. All right, there's Tiff, you just uh, identify yourself, and here's the microphone on its way. Um, I'm Mark Tilton uh, from Purdue University and a fellow here this year. Um, I'm, uh, Ed Lincoln has a new book out on East Asian regionalism and I, it's, I, I wonder if you've seen it and, mm -hmm. and if, what, what comments you might have. But just what, what I, I just read the first half or so. What I get from it is essentially that, uh, well, there really isn't anything to East Asian regionalism so far that if we look at trade figures over the past couple of decades, there ha really hasn't been any increase in intra-regional trade. Um, that way, the expansion that you see is, it, is, it, is, the, is the rise of China, but everybody's trading more with China. Um, and that uh, because of a number of reasons, security, et cetera, Asia's not really going to pull together. Uh, so that, well, there's really nothing to, to worry about or be optimistic about either way um, for Asia. Um, one of the reasons that he points out is that, well, given, the, given Japan's the sort of non non tariff barriers that aren't that aren't amenable to uh, formal agreements. Why would all these a East Asian countries really want to have um, complete open door agreements with Japan? So, just curious, your response to it. Yeah, I've I've seen the book. I got the book uh, some time ago. I think it's an interesting argument. I think this book suffers a little bit from the same arguments as Jeff Frankel's criticisms of people who thought that regionalism was growing, right? He looked at regionalism, he saw growing trade figures, and Frankel made a very good point. He said, listen, a lot of this inter-regional uh, inter trade is natural trading blocks, right? There was a whole debate about this, is this natural, or as I think Krugman called it, supernatural, and all this kind of debate. Well, just to say that, well, these trade figures are going up, but they're, they're normal, does not suggest to me that this does not have important significance for future development down the line. I mean, to say that, well, you know, this is just a normal part. After all, they're opening up their markets towards each other, so Japan and China are trading a lot more. Once they start doing that, that creates a political dynamic. I think that's where I, I differ. So simply to say, well, not much is probably going to happen, there, there's probably some truth. I don't think anything's going to happen in the next three years. I'm not, you know, I'm not crying wolf right now. What I'm saying is that we have to think about what is our strategy towards Asia? What is our vision of what's going to happen and that? How will we link to Asia? And I si think that simply too much is sp time is spent on everybody figuring out which little country is next that we are interested in negotiating with and not enough time figuring out, okay, what relationship do we do want to have with China and Japan and Korea? What will happen if they start moving closer together and start linking up? Where, what will our role be? I don't see many debates on that beyond saying, well, gee, you know, we should have more relationship with Asia. Let's, think, let's, let's just do that. I mean, there's no m a mechanism of developing that. When I went to the State Department talking about this, there's no one even follows these issues. And I, I went to this meeting I was mentioning in December on East Asia Forum, ASEAN Plus Three meeting, which was trying to develop a PEC-like organization. I was the only American there. And when I mentioned this to somebody, they said, oh, yeah, really? What happened? I said, well, there was this ASEAN plus three, and Mathir was there, and all these other leaders, former leaders and leaders were there, and they all said, we've had enough. We're going to develop our own agreement, and, you know, the heck with you guys. Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, I think that's pretty significant, even if trade figures don't show it right now. And so that, that's my concern. 
Yes, the gentleman right there is the microphone says so if you just identify yourself. Okay. My name is Ding Xin Li from uh, China Economic Daily. Actually, uh, my question is uh, directed to Dr. Stern. You mentioned about China, and uh, my question is uh, in taking the initiative to push uh, trading blocks in Asia, especially in East Asia, what problems or obstacles China should overco overcome to play its uh, proper role? Well, I think that's a fabulous question, uh, and I uh, would love to have some time to think about it. Um, as I said in my aside, uh, I tend to look at what the U.S. should be doing to advance its national interest, um, and the fact that you've asked that question just demonstrates to me how uh, adroit um, uh, China is, too, um, when it has thinkers who are asking that kind of a question. Um, I would have to spend a lot of time um, talking about, first and foremost, I suppose, uh, the relationship with Japan, because that's the most important trading relationship uh, in the region. Um, I defer to Vinny on the point about South Korea being a bridge, potentially, and playing a bridge. Uh, between Japan and China, given the cultural uh, hang-ups, which are very interesting to see persisting so many years uh, after uh, World War II, at least. Um, the U.S. and Germany, uh, I think, through a lot of institution building, uh, including the Bretton Woods institutions, NATO, um, other institutions, uh, facing its history, uh, having open discussions about its history, um, have been able to get over that hang up a lot better. So, uh, so I mean, that's a challenge to Japan. I think it's a challenge to uh, China. Um, but oftentimes, you know, culture is the thing that. Uh, can trip up uh, uh, rational economic or commercial uh, or political calculations, but so I, I think that's an important thing. Um, you know, I could I could go on, um, but I'm really just thinking out loud. Um, I don't have a kind of a systematic point by point answer to your question, but um, love to have the assignment and. Uh, <laughs> If, you, if uh, there's ever a conference to talk about that, that would be a fun thing to really uh, uh, broach. Kent, can I leap in with some? Yes, please. Everybody please. likes to give gratuitous advice to China, particularly when invited by <laughs> <laughs> a Chinese official. Um, and lately, the U.S. gratuitous advice has been to appreciate the exchange rate substantially, and that will that advice will continue. And I think there's a good argument that what China is doing. Uh, together with other Asian countries, which uh, peg, basically they're pegging to the RMB, but they're doing it by uh, pegging to the dollar, uh, is to um, fundamentally change uh, the Smithsonian Agreement, which was a, an agreement of floating rates between major blocks of countries. That doesn't mean Panama has to float, but it does mean that Europe against U.S., against Japan, and against East Asia, China has to float in order for the balance to be struck. So anyway, there's a big part of the world which is out of that for right now, and how long that will last remains to be seen. However, my suggestion, which is on this same issue, and I know it's unthinkable because it's never been done before, but if China really wanted to seize the multilateral leadership which uh, Paula is urging upon China, which uh, is part of Vinny's message as well, there is no better time when than now when the EU and the U.S. are in disarray. And it's very simple. China should unilaterally liberalize a lot. Now, this is good for China. Everybody says the exchange rate appreciation is good for China, and I think there's some of that truth. But I want to talk about why unilateral trade liberalization is good for China. China has nominal tariffs, which are about in the 12 or 12% 12 range on average, unweighted average. Uh, collected rates are about 3%, 2%. Where does the rest go? Corruption. <laughs> Corruption is a problem. It's not a killing problem in China, but it's a problem. 
Get rid of the corruption, bring the official, bring the actual rates down to what are in fact collected rates, which is about an average of 3% across a whole range of goods. Then you're in the same tariff league with um, EU, US, Canada, Japan. That still leaves agriculture. I think it's in China's interest to liberalize agriculture a lot as well because of water shortages and industrial growth and so on. I know that's much more sensitive. And China could also uh, do exactly what this uh, semiconductor case asked for, which is to get rid of the over rebates of the. Uh, it's not really under, over rebates. That's the wrong thing. It's the differential rebate or the discriminatory rebate of uh, value added tax internally. It could do all that kind of stuff and really have a big bang on the world system. I mean, it would be like, uh, you know, who's the new leader on the block? And it would be good for the world economy. So that's, that would be my advice to China to, uh, to do in the next couple of, well, next couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat accelerated timetable. This uh, gentleman, please, uh, microphone's on its way. Introduce yourself, if you would. Uh, Bernard Gordon, uh, University of New Hampshire and GW. Um, Vinny and I talked about this for a few moments in, moments in the subway the other day, but I want to you know, compliment him and again reiterate the last point uh, that uh, he was making, that the United States seems to have not been looking at what, in fact, is not simply an increase in China's role that, that Lincoln has talked about, but at the same time, and this can be very readily seen, a decline in the role of the United States in its trade with East Asia. In the piece I put out in Foreign Affairs last summer, the, the imports from uh, U.S. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, sorry, um, China, U.S. And, and Japan imports compared uh, on the China side, they had not yet crossed the line. Now, as of 2002, they have crossed the line. In, in, in this past year, uh, 2003, um, Japan's imports from China are now significantly larger than from the United States. The same, the same patterns are very evident with regard to Korea, with regard to all, all of the ASEAN countries, 50% increases uh, in the uh, ASEAN countries' imports from, from China, declines in the role of, of the United States. The point that I think that, that Vinny is making, and certainly the one that I would underline, is that we have, this government has essentially um, and under both administrations, under the Clinton administration as well as this administration, has really been looking the other way and in a fool's errand, in my view, with the FTAA. It's coming apart now, but it was both doomed to come apart and is un a totally unuseful um, errand. And that's why I think that Vinny's right on the right track when he talks about uh, zealots. I have another term for that, it, it's okay in polite company. But I think that the bottom line is that the United States has been looking away from East Asia in order to concentrate on what it imagined to be a large market in the Western Hemisphere, which in reality, other than Mexico, does not exist for the United States, has not historically existed, and even now decreasingly exists for the United States. Yes, the gentleman at the back there. Thank you. Uh, Robert Colarino, American Industrial. I was curious as to some of the, the rhetoric on, on outsourcing, how that may, in fact, affect some of the stakeholders at the table with regards to, with regards to trade. I, I was particularly curious as to some of the recent visits to Asia, whether they view that as just talk or because it's coming from both parties, as, as, uh, as you're seeing. But uh, I was curious as to some panel's thoughts to that. Why don't you start? Well, I think we should get Kent to answer this question since he just had a good, great panel on outsourcing, and uh, maybe you could summarize. I think some of the arguments there were very impressive. Well, I think I fall uh, on the question of, of outsourcing. Uh, starting with the politics, you're going to hear a lot about it uh, over the course of this election. And you're going to hear a lot about it not because of its quantitative impact so far, but because the, uh, the fear really has gone ahead of the current facts. Uh, the fear may have some, some good grounding. There's been a recent study at a Berkeley department that looked at 
the number of jobs that might be outsourced. They developed a set of criteria and applied it to BLS categories. And according to their statistics in 2001, there were 14 million jobs that could be outsourced. Anecdotes suggest that that may be an understatement in terms of the types of work that can be digitized and analyzed anywhere in the world. So I think you will hear a lot about it. Uh, another perspective, and I may fall into the heretic camp here, is that if you step back and say that from, uh, say, the mid-1980s on, or the late 1980s on, uh, about three billion people have joined what we think of as the world economy. You had the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the satellite nations as part of the Soviet bloc, an area that has always emphasized engineering, science, technical education. Uh, China, at about that time, uh, becomes, at least in journalistic parlance, a thoroughgoing capitalist rotor, very externally oriented, very intent on moving up not only the value-added uh, ladder in terms of manufacturing, but also intent on entering the online service business. Uh, India, I would say, uh, finally decided that the Fabians had it wrong <laughs> and, <laughs> and have moved in a market-oriented direction, capitalized on some existing educational strengths, uh, and really have become a, a very effective service provider, not only in the IT world, but in quite an array of services that go beyond that. So I think that this is going to force a major structural adjustment uh, on Europe and the United States. I suspect that business schools, for instance, by the end of this decade, may be phasing out their accounting departments. That work won't be done here anymore. So it's, like so many big changes, it's an enormous opportunity for us to, again, respond, at least as the U.S. has historically, to Sputnik to the competitive challenge posed by Germany and Japan in the 1980s. But it is going to require that level of, uh, of response, I believe. I want to just make one point on, on this outsourcing, which follows up on what uh, Gary had actually said. It strikes me that this is the time, if I were in the IT and telecom business, that I would keep my mouth shut about textile, steel, and agriculture, because I have much bigger fish to fry with outsourcing. So if anything, this is giving them a greater incentive to focus on their inputs and not focus on building a free trade. If they're going to say, well, listen, we're outsourcing, and by the way, we should also get rid of textile and steel protection and open up agriculture, that is a, a path to death for these companies politically. So if anything, this strategy for them, I see, will, they will be even more marginalized in the trade policy-making game in Washington because they have such an important stake in the outsourcing game. And so I think they will really be quiet now about these other sectors. And if there's massive protectionism in these sectors against China and whatever, I think they'll just be quiet because they'd rather be focusing on getting those outsourcing in India and other countries and moving to the next country where they need to outsource. So I think that is even more dangerous now for the global, or the US, I should say, glo US, global, uh, US trade coalition for, for global trade. Hmm. Uh, you know, I. I, I I just don't think we're going to get massive protectionism. That's all. That was. Um, you you don't get a lot of dumping cases, but I mean when you add it all up, I don't think it's going to be massive protectionism. Um, and uh, as for the outsourcing and your point about the uh, uh, need to have a U.S. response, a constructive response, I would just like to put on the table the fact um, uh, that women's participation in information technology and computer sciences, Vinnie's wife uh, accepted, um, is declining. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm doing, um, it looks like I'm going to start to do some work um, to proselytize about this problem for the National Center for Women and in Information Technology. Um, so, you know, we might start by uh, um, uh, looking at at least at half of the potential workforce here who is disproportionately and, uh, and in a declining fashion participating in information technology. I think that's an excellent, uh, <coughs> excellent point. Do we have another question? I think we have really, we promised to have you out the door by five and we've not surprisingly slipped slightly past that hour. Uh, 
I would just ask you please to join me in a round of applause for an outstanding presentation of <laughs> terrific panel. And thank you all for coming. Paul, the way you were speaking, it sounded like you had seen a paper. I always have good thank you. What I asked him to send me was as much stuff as possible. So what I got. Well, I will get him to send me some of this. Yeah. Stuff too. Uh, this is the. Uh, well, he has so many papers, but the one that I was talking about with such a. Oh, it's wonderful. You ought to, you ought to tell it. I just thought this was just weird. The Panini, Panini's professor to get tenure, right? <laughs> It's, it looks like it must be the introduction to his, and I marked it all up, here it is. It's this one, Beyond Network Power, the Dynamics of the Dynamics of the Yes, right, and beyond the chaos. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. What's American? Great to see you. I'm going to be doing, oh, speaking of, this is a great, great week. I'm going, I'm going to spend the weekend talking about the Latin American trade, and I know your former trade negotiator I'm going to be moderating. So I'm going to be moderating that program, I think, this Sunday. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, hopefully I'll be in touch. Oh, Kim, it's a pleasure. Great to see you. There's a lot. Well, I don't even, I need to 